This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with art collector and facilitator Tubador, who along with business partner Meta Coven, became the subject of headlines worldwide this past March when the pair purchased Beeple's first 5,000 days at a Christie's auction for $69 million. Tubador discusses his background, his journey into crypto, the ability of NFTs to undo colonial damage, and what the future holds. At the end of the episode, I'll be taking a look at some of the week's top art headlines. But first up, what comes after the first 5,000 days? With Tubador. thrilled to, to have you as a guest on the podcast today. I gather that six years ago, you wouldn't have anticipated being where you are today. And so I was wondering if we could start with maybe you describing your crypto journey. Well, first off, thank you for having me, Craig. And <laughs> it, it, it's a weird story in a sense. Uh, I mean, my crypto story, from many perspectives, at least from the conventional way people look at crypto, it is a series of missed opportunities because uh, I was first introduced to Bitcoin in 2013, very generously, my dad, by Meta Coven, who discovered it himself. I was uh, a journalist back then, and uh, Meta Coven, who was an uh, app developer in Chennai. So he and I were working on a, a project together, and he discovered Bitcoin, and he told me all about it, and it flew right over my head. and. Uh, <laughs> that package of information that he shared with me was enough to give him wings and to set him off on a journey of uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and discovery uh, all over the world. And me, on the other hand, it left me completely unaffected. And it would be years, about four years, before we sort of uh, you know found each other again and decided to work together on something. And we... Medikovan and I, we sort of, uh, we worked on a DeFi protocol for a little bit. I dove right into DeFi from 2017 onwards, uh, which was an interesting time to get into crypto (laughs) because it it was right at the brink of of a precipice from which crypto fell and and didn't wake up for for two years. So it was, it's a nice uh, uh, leap of faith and also a good litmus test, you know, just, just to complete the loop, I finally found my groove only at the beginning of the pandemic when i discovered the nft space and this makes a lot of sense because this this also speaks to the power of the phenomenon of nfts themselves because uh crypto as by itself is is abstract it's hard to understand and it's accessible mostly to people who either know how to code or who are very comfortable with financial instruments NFTs, on the other hand, suddenly make all of those abstract concepts of uh, uh, independent, um, you know, uh, financial independence or, uh, you know, the idea of immutability and all of those things more vivid and, and visible. And I think the reason we're seeing this, this massive influx of people and interest and artists and creatives is is that fact and my own story is a perfect illustration before you and medico and got together to, to create metapurse what exactly was your background well i was a i was a journalist for about eight years the first eight years of my career because it, it, it felt obvious at the time because the only thing i didn't absolutely suck at was was communication was being able to write it's something i enjoyed um, so it, I, I was sort, I sort of gravitated towards it. it. It took me eight years to figure out that journalism as such was not my calling, but communications was. And I meandered my way through um, advertising, through writing about supply chain finance. Uh, you know, inexplicably, I spent six months researching and writing about uh, uh, cargo trucks. I, I, I don't know, it's a complete waste of my, my time, but there, there you have it. Uh, before I stumbled upon um, uh, crypto. The thing is, the idea is that the more I learned about money, 
the more uh, socially and politically aware I became, the more crypto started to make sense. So for my listeners who aren't familiar with Metapurse, how would you describe your organization and its mission? It's something we think about constantly. The um, the organization itself is, is pretty simple. It's, it's kind of a straightforward thing. It uh, began as a way to uh, consolidate our intentions in this space. That's that's how I can put it like fairly accurately. Um, Metacoin had started collecting NFTs from um, I mean since since 2017 itself, but I think we sort of put a, a name to it. Um, in September of 2020, uh, because by then I had sort of had my own parallel journey as Troubadour in the metaverse, and uh, we discovered over time that our, um, you know, our, uh, the way we look at NFT sort of converged at a certain point, and we decided to uh, form Metaverse to, you know, to to see how we can engage with this new phenomenon, with this with this renaissance as we saw it. And so Metapurse does a whole lot of things, but the idea is, is sort of twofold uh, at, at the most obvious level. It is an experiment in trying to engage with this renaissance. How do we be part of it? How do we um, you know, empower it, drive it, and empower the right people in it? And the other, I, uh, I suppose the, the, the larger goal for us is to serve the cause of decoloniality. Um, you know, it, it's an idea propounded by um, the you know Walter Mignolo, but it is something that we identify with very strongly. So you know that that brings up a good point. You know, when when I saw you and Metacoven speak at NFT NYC, I, I feel like you two were laying out kind of a unique vision for Metapurse, and honestly, a, a like a new worldview. Most people that day were t- on stage talking about superhero collectibles and sports card NFTs, but you two start talking about Water Mignolo and uh, folks like Alfredo Jar. Can you talk a little bit more about decoloniality and how that integrates with Metapurse's mission? I mean, it, it, it is the culmination of years of, uh, I mean, empirical experience as well, right? Our own personal story in the world and in the space. Uh, it just so happens that Walter Mignolo helped us give some sort of uh, uh, <laughs> give us a word for it and uh, some sort of structure to what we want to do in the world. Decoloniality, I suppose the simplest way to describe it would be um, it's like unless your culture or your identity or your art can be described uh, or expressed in one of five European languages, it is not considered culture or art. It just doesn't exist in the world. And uh, uh, India, where we come from, is a country of many countries. And the India that you see or the West experiences is not something even I can relate to, right? Because uh, um, Bollywood is not me. I mean, chicken tikka masala is not me. Hindi is not me. I speak uh, a language. I grew up in a culture which is, um, currently being systematically sort of smothered in this wave of homogeneity and authoritarianism, which frankly is rampant not just in India, but all across the world, right? So decoloniality is the idea of uh, sort of, um, I wouldn't say um, changing the balance, but bringing to the fore or bringing to the surface cultures which existed before, uh, you know, the the original wave of coloniality uh, sort of smothered them, and also which the current wave of neocoloniality is sort of um, again uh, threatening to smother them and into extinction, basically. So, I mean, it, it's uh, it, it all sounds a little bit dark, but the the light at the end of the tunnel and the happy accident is that this idea of decoloniality happens to be best served by the <laughs> the NFT renaissance, which is effectively, um, you know, an opportunity for the global South to express itself culturally, rather than purely on ideological terms, or, you know, or, or on verbal terms, or in 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 a sort of uh, um, angry manner, if you know what I mean. 
right? The the anger or the frustration is uh, inevitable. It's perfectly understandable. But what we realize is that it's it might not be entirely necessary, and it might not be the best vehicle uh, to you know to to express yourself. In. I mean, um, art does it much better. Music is way more uh, um, you know um, rugged in such environments. For instance, even at Dreamverse, right? I mean, two aspects of it, which which I thought made the whole uh, experience worth it, were one, the live drawing performance by the Dada Art Collective. I mean, it apart from you know amazing people like Judy Mann or or Sparrow, it included uh, you know three people from Latin America who had never been to the U.S. before. That's I mean, it's, it's just amazing, and what they created uh, sort of it spoke to everybody that walked through those halls and similarly this uh, um, Pradeep Kumar who's from uh, where you know where I'm from and his uh, collective of artists um, you know they they performed live uh, at uh, at Dreamburst because they created the soundscape of, uh, of the whole thing and what uh, Pradeep and, and his 42 band of 42 artists you know from the hinterland of South India and what Dada created proved beyond doubt that, you know, to, to be able to appreciate, uh, you know, decolonial art or culture, you need not necessarily have some sort of a shared uh, point of reference in that culture. You just drop it in an interesting place and, you know, people will still enjoy it because art speaks a language uh, like, uh, which doesn't require language. It, 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 it's, it hits you at something, uh, at, at a part of yourself that's pure and uh, something that is unsullied by context, if that makes sense. You know, in the days following Metapurse's acquisition of, you know, the, the Beeple NFT, the, the big one, it seems that, you know, part of the messaging I was hearing from, from you was that crypto allows for true decentralization in an erasure of geographic power centers. And so by buying such a historic piece at such a historic price, you were kind of intending to challenge preconceptions about South Asian capabilities. Did I get that right? Would you agree with that? Yes, uh, I would agree with that. Uh, but what we discovered uh, later on, I mean, first off, yes, uh, while that might not have been our original intention when we went into the auction, because it couldn't have been, right? Because even we had no idea that it would go all the way to $60 million. I mean, we there was no um, the only thing we worked towards as we walked uh, into that auction was uh, to make sure Christie's didn't give us some sort of a ceiling on how much we could spend. But otherwise, uh, you know, we had no grand uh, intentions or you know um, to to sort of uh, signal this this message. Uh, it was more a realization than an intention uh, towards that auction. So so yes, in a sense. When you think of uh, accomplishment, when you think of uh, taste making in the world, uh, the palette is usually monochrome. It's usually Caucasian. So it, it must have come as a surprise to a lot of people, and it did. And uh, we did have some interesting and very mixed reactions. I mean, uh, questions about the legitimacy of the sale itself, which is, which is funny because, I mean, uh, Christie's is probably the most uh, legitimate platform there is when it comes to art sales, historically speaking. Um, I mean, um, I'm sure you know many blockchain-based platforms can and do give them a run for their money when it comes to uh, you know uh, privacy, <laughs> when it comes to uh, arbitrary ceilings on how much a person can spend on their platform. But there you have it. So there are questions about the legitimacy of the sale. There were questions about whether uh, it was art or not there were you know very serious questions about uh, our own legitimacy as people whether we were genuine whether we were scammers and so on and so forth but these are uh, mostly expressions of disbelief that someone that looked or talked like us could do something uh, of the kind that we did so yes it, it is very much a message but you know post the people incident as we call it and what we also realize is that it paints a very um, one-dimensional picture, not just of what happened, but also of us, of 
our uh, intentions in this space, right? And it's difficult to move away from that narrative. There is no room for.